I am saddened by the fact that the judiciary has now found itself being sucked into politics. I am also sad to the extent that even we who are priests in the church are getting sucked in politics because you will never come out the same. These are the views of my guest on the program. Not very flattering when you consider that politics is a call to serve. But somehow, the games around the profession have removed the morality we should naturally be at its core. And that forms the crux of our conversation today. Hello and welcome to Political Paradigm, live from our Abuja studios here on Channels Television. I am Kayla Magua. My guest on the program is the Catholic Bishop Sukoto Archdiocese, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka. Oh, but he's so much more. Over the years, the good bishop has become the voice of the voiceless, a man whose legacy has definitely engraved his name on the fabric of our history as a people. And while he says he will not be making a good president, even though he has been pressured to run for office for the past 30 years, when this member of the Dicastery on Integral Human Development has blessed this country with his service in various quarters and his honest commentary on national issues over the decades have become a reference point for the Nigerian people. Bishop Hassan Kuka, welcome to Political Paradigm. Thank you, Kayla. Thanks for having me. It's really nice to have you here. You've Thank been you. very vocal, especially since, you know, this year is one of the most important years in Nigeria's history. We had our general elections in 2023. But I want to start off by talking about that comment you made about the judiciary and, you know, religious leaders. You did mention priests, you know, being sucked into the political process. Just so people can understand what you mean by them being, you know, sucked into politics. Well, you know, if you, I think if you understand what the judiciary is and what the priesthood is, then you know that uh, these are sanctuaries, sacred sanctuaries inhabited by human beings, all the same. But to which public trust uh, is preeminent. Uh, the judiciary is made up of human beings and um, everywhere you go in the world, it has reverence. It commands awe. But of recent, you know, um, we have now, the judiciary has now found itself, literally, dragged into politics because it didn't, it's not the judges that step forward to say we want to hear a case. People took the cases to them. And happily yesterday I was in the Supreme Court and I listened to the Chief Justice of Nigeria. You should read his speech. I'm sure it's online delivered a fantastic speech, but also spoke about their own trials, their tribulations, public expectations, and they also acknowledge you know, that something has happened to the institution. In the same way that uh, the church, if people stepped into politics, and a lot of people have stepped into politics, I'm talking despite running against the run of play, because as priests, at least I can speak as a Catholic priest, the canon law does not allow you to be a car carrying member of a party. You cannot stand for election. And I think that that neutrality is actually the strength of those, these institutions. And whether it's the military, if you read, for example, two books, the book by the former chief of army staff, uh, General Mameyi, and another book by God bless his soul, he died only last week, General Chris Garba. Both of these were former army chiefs. And they speak most eloquently about the consequences and the corrosive impact on the integrity of the military once the military jumped into the public space of politics. So what I'm saying in effect is that we're all, like I said, I'm, a, I'm not a politician, but I'm political because I have got enough political consciousness and it comes with, all, with being human. So my, my agony is not, I'm not speaking alone because the judges themselves are worried about what has become of their institution. So I think these are the critical issues. Politics has its own rhythm, it has its own constituency, it has its own actors. Okay, so it's like football. I like to watch football, I like to play football, but I don't get paid. Those who get paid are those who actually go in as professionals. So um, we're all interested in, in the judiciary, and I think that uh, from what the, the, the Chief Justice of Nigeria had to say yesterday, uh, they're getting their own act together. But my hope and my prayer is that political processes in Nigeria will get to a point in which these institutions, more or less, will be free to do the things that they were set up to do. 
I mean, one of the issues that many people have been bringing up, mostly for political actors and pundits, really, of Nigeria's political process following, you know, these judicial pronouncements that have come up after the elections, both for the uh, general elections and the, you know, the other elections that we've seen going on in the country. Many people feel like the judiciary in many ways may not be, you know, fair and providing, you know, the platform where everyone can trust the judgments that come from the judiciary. So basically well, accusing them the, of being partisan. The judiciary is not meant to make people happy. Okay? You go to court, only one person will probably go away happy. So two people cannot go to court and everybody is, is quite happy. Something must give. And I feel sorry for judges because I've, I'd always said if I, was, if I weren't a priest, I would have been a lawyer. But I've always been saying to myself, I would never have been able to agree to be a judge because of the huge demands. And as I said, I, I have been blessed to have seen some really very serious judges at close range. I had the honor of working with uh, Justice Owais. I had the honor of working with Justice Oputa. And they are not working with Justice Nikki Toby. And I, I just, for me, the whole idea that a decision you make determines, is literally life and death decisions you have to make every day. And you are human because every judge is subjected to the same aggregate of identities that all of us have. So imagine you have a case, your classmates are calling you, your in-laws are calling you, your in-laws, friends, relations are calling you, uh, the people in government are calling you, interested parties, everybody is calling you. And Social think, media is firing so, you. No, well, no, even, <laughs> you know, the criticism is different from people who are asking for a favor. You know, as I said, quarreling with the judges and feeling happy or unhappy, that's the easy part. The difficult part is I imagine what these people have to cope with because everybody, including me, humble me, and small me, I've been, people have been calling, please call so, so, and so, please call so, so, and the case is before a tribunal. We all say we want justice. But what, if you see justice, will you really recognize it? So I think that uh, they deserve our prayers. Let me put it that way. But I think that uh, the attacks have largely not been pretty well founded. This con the, uh, it's difficult to imagine whether you're going to have a judiciary that can rise beyond the reality around which it survives. Nor the church, nor the business, nor economy, nor politics. So we want to excuse ourselves. We're always looking for scapegoats. Right now, the scapegoat for our judicial process happens to be the judiciary. But the issues are much more than that. It's got to do with the actors. It's got to do with the discipline. If there are no infractions, nobody will go to court. You know, so I, I remember one, I met a, a senior advocate of Nigeria yesterday in the, in the Supreme Court, and he said to me, he said, Bishop, I wanted to write a letter to you, and I said, okay, I'm sorry, sir. What, so why didn't you? He said, because you said in, in, in Bielsa that uh, judges, should, I mean, lawyers should be put out of a job because, and I, he said, what do you want us to do? And I got a text from a lawyer who said, you don't want us to eat? And I said, well, you can eat elsewhere, but on this particular pond, if things get stable, then you can do, deal with other cases, all right? If there are no sinners, there will be no priests. It's our prayer that everybody stops to, but this is the situation we found ourselves in. So I think we must come to terms with the fact that first, we are going to be on this road for a very long time. Okay, we are focusing on free and fair and credible elections. They are desirable. But desirable as they may be, they are necessary, but they are not a sufficient condition or a guarantee that the outcome will be what we think it is. You can have the freest, the fairest election, the most credible elections, and it could give you some character that is not what you expected. And for us in a rather dysfunctional environment such as this, they have, of course we should contest all these things, but if at the end decisions are taken, it may be that the person you really didn't expect much from, maybe because of process and other things, has turned out completely differently. You know, so I think that the most critical thing is for us to develop the tools of engagement and engaging this process because judges will not act independent of us. Lawyers would, I mean, lawyers, politicians, everybody. So this country is ours to build, you know, and I think that um, the judiciary is a vital component but I, do, I worry that uh, by finding itself right in the arena of politics, yes, people are making money, but this is not what politics was meant to be. It was meant to give money to a, a, another group of people, not necessarily lawyers. Uh, and I think that 
Lawyering has taken over our politics to the point that I don't need to tell you. Everybody who lives in Nigeria knows, you know. So the frivolous cases that have been uh, brought to the court, I was happy to hear the Chief Justice of Nigeria say they are also setting up an arbitration portal, you know, in the Supreme Court. So people can find other ways of resolving their conflicts because, look, we are Africans, let me put it that way. My little experience at the Oputa panel led me to believe that, look, we are not necessarily so adversarial. And the, the judicial system that we have, adversarial justice systems tend to think about winners and losers. But African culture is always more towards consensus. And I think that um, the idea of alternative conflict resolution mechanisms grew out of the feeling, especially in, in the corporate world, about the corporate damage that institutions felt. If you took Coca-Cola to court, if you took MTN to court, if you took any of these brands to court, it, created, it left a damage. So people began to find other ways away from the courts. So really, I mean, the more the courts have less work to do, the better evidence it is that a society is growing because there are a range of other actors on the scene that can be brought into, into bear, you know, to help our communities. And I think we must explore those possibilities. Not every, every case that must go to court. Because it's costing people money, it's costing us time, it's costing us energy, it's costing us trust, you know. But by and large, I think we must be sincere with ourselves to know that, look, uh, our system has its own problems. For example, if you look at the, the, the Nigerian judiciary, the idea that a, a, a judge will retire at the age of 70, at the Supreme Court. For me, it, it doesn't make much sense. Is it the money to pay them? Because when, when I looked at somebody like Joseph Soputa, well into his 80s, these people are still very clear-minded and so on. There's a lot they can still contribute. Um, in the American Supreme Court, for example, when, once you are appointed a Supreme Court justice, you literally stay on until, until you die or until you want to retire. And there have been one or two, you know, incidents in which, in which people maybe didn't retire but were made to retire in one way or the other. But I think that for the judiciary, we should think a little bit more creatively. But this is Nigeria where everything is turn by turn. Everybody wants a piece of the action. If you say, okay, let justices stay for too long, what about us? Now, if you have the time, we can talk about some of those issues. Because right now, the president, President Bola Tinubu is going to be perhaps... We are the only president in the world, because I don't know anywhere else, that it is now going to be within his power to appoint 11 Supreme Court justices. Uh, <laughs> it comes with a lot of responsibility, because among other things now, there has to be, a government has to have the capacity and the ability to make, there has to be a certain level of believability and credibility about what people see. You know, if you watch a football match now, and you see 10 players and, or 11 players, and there's one black man, even if it's a mulatto, you are, you are reflexes. You will feel interested in, 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 in that black man. Similarly, you know, if you permit me, if you look at the American Supreme Court, about which I know very, almost next to nothing, but in 1967, President Johnson had a, took a decision. And his decision was, I need to get a black man into the Supreme Court. I need to get a black man into the Supreme Court. Because he came out of the, of the, of the struggle of Martin Luther King, John, the, the ideals of John F. Kennedy, and so on. And of course, there was Togood Marshall, an extraordinarily brilliant you know, human being. But there were, there were no vacancies in the Supreme Court. And he couldn't ask anybody to resign. But guess what he did? There was a justice who was in the Supreme Court, Justice Tom Clark. And then Tom Clark was only 67 years old. But Johnson wanted, because they were friends, he couldn't tell him to leave the Supreme Court. Instead, what did he do? He decided to, um, to, to promote Tom Clark's son, Ramsey Clark, and made him Attorney General. He therefore forced Tom Clark to say to himself, am I going to be sitting in the Supreme Court? Am I going to block the ambition of my son? So he very quickly eased himself out, which was what uh, Johnson wanted. And Johnson used the opportunity to, to push Togut Marshall. Marshall. When a president wants to do good, let me put it that way, that, you know, this country is a complicated country. And there has to always to be, the problem I had with President Buhari, nothing personal, but how to manage diversity is critical to how people perceive the legitimacy of a government. So I'm hoping that, look, if you are going to appoint 
11 Supreme Court justices. You must also look at this country. Okay, it's not a question of uh, the Supreme Court, I, I guess, functions on the fact that you have to just, I'm sure there is this debate among them. Uh, people should come from the judiciary, but there are people coming from the academia. We have a black justice of the Supreme Court of America for the first time, Ketanji Jackson. It's unprecedented. Uh, people have come from the, you know, from the academia and so on. So I'm hoping that President Tinubu will also be sufficiently creative to draw inspiration from using the Supreme Court, you know, to become, and you don't do this by lowering standards. Because people, when you talk about federal character, people tend to think that, oh, you're just lowering the thing so that those who can't pass exam can also come in. It's not so. Bishop, you know, the concept of the president appointing in any capacity, whether it is for the Supreme Court or whether it is resident electoral commissioners, or whatever it is, many Nigerians, when they see, because the president himself is a politician, so, so the, the trust in, in the fact that this politician, you know, who picked these people, would these people not owe their allegiance to him? Is that well, something look, that you think about? I mean, about? it's not like picking the super egos where <laughs> uncle, brother, traditional rule, everybody wants. No, it's not. I think the processes are a bit complicated, but they also speak to the level of activism because people can, 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 like I, I once said, there are certain Nigerians that if I saw them in the Supreme Court, they won't be perfect, but they will give me an impression of where this government is going. And I think that Bola Metinibu, President Bola Metinibu has, <laughs> whatever it is that may be his other problems, it is that he's not ignorant of the political terrain in Nigeria. He's perhaps the first person to come out of what we may call the human, I mean, the civil society struggles, you know, of the last 20 or more than 20 years, beginning with the Abacha period. So it is difficult for him to make mistakes if he's serious about what he needs to do. You know, that he already has an idea and he evidently has a passion for, for human rights, for justice, for fairness, for equity. Uh, his calling card was always the whole question about, about, about federalism. They popularize all that notion. Now he has the time. He must walk the talk. And I'm saying that, look, uh, a president, as I said, you have to want to send out a signal. And here, of course, I commend the president. The very fact that from where we were coming, all right, where we were coming from, uh, my former governor in Kaduna had said that until the video leaked, had said that, look, um, we are going to be in power for 20 years, and that this Muslim Muslim ticket business was to make sure that we're in power for another 20 years uninterrupted. But happily, people were wondering why I wasn't shouting up against Muslim Muslim ticket. I focus on individuals and what I think they can bring to the table. There are certain people today that they don't have to be from my community, they don't have to be Catholic, they don't have to be Christian. Most of the people I deal with, I probably, it takes me a long time to know where they are from and what they, so, but the illusion that somebody will craftily say that I have prepared this bed of power in which we are going to lie for the next 20 years uninterrupted. Now, it takes the political sagacity of a Tinibu and a Shetima, whom I, luckily I happen to know both of them at different times. But my knowledge of them was enough for me to know that these are not people who will instrumentalize religion. They might have other flaws, but I can feel comfortable in their hands that being a Christian will not, make, will not be a liability to me. Now, where these other people were coming from, who were expecting that a Muslim Muslim ticket was going to be the instrumentalization of power and that the rest of us will probably be cleaning the streets and so on and so forth for another 20 years. But look what God did. I mean, let me put it that way, because suddenly when the names of, of even the service chiefs are announced, everybody is happy. And I remember I sent a text to, no, I won't tell you that, I won't say that. Because, no, but I'm saying, see the, see the reaction. So, you, but so, then, so now, people should rest. Is that, is, that's the message. No, 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 no. People, people should relax. I think we should relax. You know, be, I'm focused on outcomes. Look, the very fact that I probably will not have a problem. The very fact that the president appoints doesn't mean the president does not consult. Only a stupid man will refuse to consult. The processes of consultation are different. It doesn't mean that because the president didn't call, pick up his phone to call Bishop Kuka, therefore the president is not consulting. Um, but I think what is missing in Nigeria, especially for those who are in authority and power, is that there is an abysmal ignorance from the subnational level. There are many governors who are probably 
who don't know the ethnic groups that make up the, the state that they govern. There are many governors who probably have never traveled around even the state that they, will, they are governing, and they may never. Because apart from state house, you go to local government headquarters, that's a state visit, unless you are cutting a tape somewhere. Otherwise, so if you, for, for power is not just something that you hold. Power and office are two different things. You know, office is different, power is different. You can have an office and not have power. You can have power and not have office. But fundamentally, for a complicated country like this, a Nigerian president must have enough sophisticated listening devices that he is hearing the voice of the voiceless, wherever they may be. Is this the president that can deliver that for us? I, I think that, you know, because President Tinubu has been been pounding the streets for so long, there are certain mistakes you should not make. The removal okay? of fuel subsidy. That is to in... understand. No, let's not even let, go Let's there. talk about the economic no, situation let, of the no, country okay. because, you know, you said no, you've had a lot of confidence. Let me, let me, you know, let me finish what I was saying. This, the structure of the Nigerian state is unscientific. It's dysfunctional. It's not working. It's the reason why I miss plenty. Okay, we are still in pain. So the Nigerian structure needs to be totally dismantled because it cannot work. What we are running, and I'm not talking here about, look, the first, the, we made two critical mistakes, and they must be part and parcel of our conversation about why things are not working in Nigeria. The first mistake we made, in my view, was to create states. All right? The creation of states, remember that states were created to stop Ojuku from going to war, not because people sat down and decided, this is how we're going to do this. Secondly, when you created state and multiply the creation of state, when you listen to stories, you, there are people who will tell you, I was the one who was responsible for the creation of Kaduna, Sukuto, Katsina, whatever state. I was the one responsible. So what happened? It was that we're not different from the, from, you know, from the, the, the Berlin Conference, where people, we, we are quarreling with white people sitting down and sharing Africa. State's creation was very much akin to that. That is, the big boys just sat down. The local government council was even worse. The result is what has triggered off the amount of conflict that continues to go on in Nigeria. That is that a man who had a seat at the table, okay, as a military officer, many of these guys simply made their villages local government headquarters or their villages states. So this arbitrariness did two things. First, Nigeria generated a certain level of consciousness that they didn't have before. After all, Igbos were very happy in Anambra, well, as Igbos. Yorubas were happy as Yorubas. Everybody was... But once you create a state, you know yourself. People were being chased out of their homes. You are from, this is Anambra, move away to Ebonyi. This is Ogun, move away to, it cascaded across, you know, across the country. So that's the first problem. The second problem was the military taking over power. And for over 30 years, if you read Chris Ali's book, he's perhaps the most cerebral of military men. His, his, what he wrote, and his grasp of the, of the issues, far more profound. But he made the point very clearly, nothing new, that by coming to power, the military destroyed the foundation of democracy. Forget about good soldiers or bad soldiers, because the military had no agenda for coming to Nigeria, rather than just anger. And in the final analysis, as Chris says, General Chris said, these guys were simply reinforcing and the rest of, in fact, he titled his book, the, 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 the military, or oh, what is it now? The Federal Republic of the Ni of Nigerian Army. The Federal Republic of Nigerian Army. Meaning that Nigeria literally was a republic that, that what we see now is, is what the military decided to give us. With no scientific precision, with no attention being paid to minorities. That's why minority agitation from the Niger Delta to, 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 to the Middle Belt went unattended to. So that we are where we are now, we, unless there's no need trying to fix Nigeria uh, in the sense that what we have now is almost an unwritten agreement. When the full, when the house are full and they finish, they will give to the Yorubas. Uh, so literally Nigeria has been between the Yorubas because the Igbos have not even, they've only been a minor majority in the sense that despite they are, they are, they are the big three, but they've never had a test. So maybe... When President Tinubu finishes, it will now be the argument will now be the North will say, no, give us back. Then somebody from the South will say, give us back. Meanwhile, nobody is paying attention to hundreds of thousands of other ethnic communities that have probably no access. So 
because the country is not working, it has created hegemonies. And these hegemonies are tied to ethnicity, to regionalism, and to religion. So this is why Nigeria is not going, is not going to work in its present form. And the only solution to this problem is not so much a question of sovereign of conferences, because there have been a million conferences, is for a president to have the political sagacity to say, this is not working. We must turn a different direction. So it's not a, because you see, if you had a country where people have a sense of belonging. I mean, what's he, what's he supposed to do? Pardon? When you say the Look, president should the, have the, the political first, sagacity see, to say, first, this first is not working, all, we need to change. First of change all, what first, exactly? First, well, first of all, it he can't turn back time. Oh, oh no, you can, listen, you cannot turn back time, but you can remember time. You don't have to turn it back. You can remember it. Certain memories that are important for how you survive. And part of the problem with Nigeria, is we, an African try to say, oh, forgive and forget. For, memory doesn't work like that. An unprocessed memory is dangerous for the person himself. That's why you see in Nigeria, there will be an, inc an exponential increase in the levels of mental health. Because so much agony is unprocessed. We're just moving. But let me tell you what has happened to Nigeria in the last 10, 15 years with banditry, with abductions, with all of these things. We will pay the price. It may not be now, but we will pay the price. Because there are a lot of people with anger, frustration. Can you imagine children watching their mothers being raped? Can you imagine children watching their parents being slaughtered? Can you remember can you, a generation of young Nigerians? It's it be difficult if you go around the Middle Belt and parts of the North. It's difficult to enter a community and find families that are not mourning. Does the state care? The state doesn't care. Okay? We just assume that uh, they have gone. We don't know when they will come. i give you an example. You know, because if you don't deal with these issues, up till today, who killed Deborah? We don't know. In so we don't know. And we will never know. And we don't want to know. But remember what happened with the killing of uh, Floyd, George Floyd. Okay, George Floyd was killed. The, pol the police officer who killed him is in prison. He was 40. He's not going to come out of prison until he's 60 or 61. He was stabbed a few uh, days ago. Very good. <laughs> That's one. Two, see what the American government did. The state of Minneapolis was compelled to pay the family of Floyd. $27 million. Yes, you had me right. $27 million. That's what they had to pay the family. Now, when people do murder human beings and nobody, you cannot, people cannot ask a question. For example, what was the cause of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the burnings in, you know, in Sokoto? Is that the, 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 the then governor, I mean, Tambo, I said, those who did this are going to be tried. And you have a band of people who say, no, you cannot even and they are more powerful than the state. And they say, you cannot. My church was, my cathedral was almost destroyed. One of my churches was, 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 was you know, partially burned. Our pastoral center was almost destroyed. Has, nobody will ask me, Bishop, how much did it cost you to build this? So, if you don't punish this, it's not for nothing. America decides that you're going to pay this amount of money. It's not about the money. It is that you will not do it again tomorrow. So what I'm saying, we have unprocessed emotions. Okay, and the political space, that's why you see Nigerian politics will remain violent because there are too many things that are bottled up in the imaginations of people. So the point I'm making is President Tinubu haven't come from a background of struggle. There are certain sins he cannot commit. And those include turning this country from neo-feudalism, okay, to a liberal democratic country by opening up the political space. And then creating the infrastructure that enables ordinary citizens, where no matter the length and breadth where they are in this country, I cannot be sitting in my village and you're treating me as if I'm, I, I happen to be here just by accident. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not an immigrant. But right now in many communities in Nigeria, people are being treated as if they are migrants. Because you are not this, you must be that. And we are running a double-decker democracy with so many layers of identity. Are you, okay, you now, you have... You have, okay, you have an employer. You go back to your village, you have to bow before a traditional ruler. And in the, when you go back home, you're only a citizen in Abuja. Back in your village, you are a subject. Okay? And then, of course, you have other layers of identity. Church is calling you here. Politics is calling you here and so on. But we need a moral compass that creates the fact that by being a citizen of this great country called Nigeria, there are rights that I'm entitled to. They're in the Constitution. 
It is a business of government to breathe life into those into that constitution. And the former vice president, sorry, I'm, the only way I got to know the uh, uh, Oshibanjo was when they set up this portal for 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 uh, justice. It was innovative. It was creative. That was when I picked up his name. Okay. When, I mean, when he was attorney general in Lagos. So there are those people who already understand the processes of creating a just society. Otherwise, what we are doing, we we'll just be going around and around saying we are conducting elections. Nigerians are frustrated whether you elect or you don't elect. Uh, it, it doesn't bring any benefit to you. I mean, there's quite a lot that we, I, I want us to talk about when it comes to reforms in the electoral process, because that conversation is going on right now. You have talked about the, judici the judiciary, you know, and, and the issues that they have to face. When it comes to the election umpire, with the elections that we've seen this year, the general elections, off-cycle elections, have, has, has INEC been able to engender the kind of trust that the Nigerian people need to trust an electoral process? Or are we stuck with, uh, with office holders by judicial pronouncements? Is, is, that, is that what we have to deal with? Okay, let me tell you something. I think it's a product of the military. And at an academic level, I can tell you that Nigeria never had a transition. We didn't have a transition. Um, and a transition from military rule is not intellectually equivalent with transi transition to democracy. Okay, because transitions are slightly different. They could be negotiated as it happened in South Africa. They could be by any other means. INEC in its present form is part of the legacy of what the military left for us, the power of the, of the, of the, of the, of the state. And what we have as the power of the state is largely a reproduction. First of all, remember that the constitution we even have, we're still not, it's still work in progress. Still a military, largely a military, a military gift to us. Now, that means that the processes of choosing and the amount of trust that a president has on, on citizens and their power and an understanding that he's ruling on their behalf, those are the things that can enable a president to be less arrogant and to say, no, the, the right of choosing this candidate should go to all of us. So, for example, in South Africa, you know, they, because it came out any country that has come out of struggle, any country at all. I give you an example in Afghanistan when they when they when, you know when they defeated the you know the Russians, and uh, in their governing council, the Supreme Council in Afghanistan, I think about 1995 or there, you know the guy who was in chairman is it in uh, what was that his name? He had one leg. Almost all the members on the table who were the policy make, who were running the country, you either had one eye or one hand, or one leg, but you have to have this ability to show that you incurred this injury during the struggle. It's not like this. Even in South Africa, after apartheid, there was a massive contestation between those who stayed and those who were away. All right? So the point I'm making is that you need a, a, a president who has come from struggle to appreciate that you have to create enough reflexes in the justice system to ensure that it is not reinforcing the old order, but that it is a, a portal to justice. So something like I choose, choosing an, an INEC chairman, because this is where the legitimacy of government, this is where the sincerity of a president lies. Are you ready to subject yourself to an independent umpire? And how independent is that umpire? The money does not belong to the president. The money belongs to Nigerians. So in my view, an INEC chairman should be screened from whether they are political scientists, sociologists, wherever their background may be. But to be able to run that office, you must show record of an appreciation of the dynamics of struggle and what running that kind of office really means. So, and I think that the, the president will, could, could have firm, but I think that we must get to a point in which ordinary citizens on their own People who want this office must be interviewed by ordinary people. I'm not talking of, of a big call, but there must be something that gives the president three names, you know, that, you know, that he's to choose from. Otherwise, this crisis will continue. And it's not because people are bad. Let's talk a bit about the economy and what Nigerians are facing right now, because in many quarters, in many parts of the country, the quality of the life of the Nigerian has dropped so exponentially and even though we've heard the explanations why this has happened, 
the long-term benefits that Nigerians are supposed to enjoy from these policies of President Bola Tinubu. Well, the policies when he came in and reaffirmed this is what has been done. The quality of life of the Nigerian really is being, you know, is being tortured as, at the moment. What, what should the president and the government in general be doing right now? Because these long-term benefits, they didn't put a timeline on when the benefits were going to come in. But lives are being lost daily. What can be done about this? You know, um, if you go back to America after the Second World War, um, Roosevelt decided, they, they knew that young people who were illiterate with no skills decided to join the army. So he had to ask himself the question, these young people have been to battle, they have seen dead bodies, they have seen how cheap life is, and they are not educated. When they come back, what am I going to do with them? He came up with what was called the, G, the, you know, the GI Bill. That bill opened up, as soldiers were coming back, opportunities, housing, and education. So you see, the problem is that um, yeah, it's like a man who they, they say, okay, carry this load. At least you have an idea what load you are carrying and what the weight is. Because you see, what is happening is that because over time, and I have spoken about this severally to the point of boredom, that this is one country where the processes of people coming to power is so undefined. And as you know, politics, everybody, you had to train to get so far. These people who are holding these cameras have been to training. Your mechanic is trained. Your shoe shiner is trained. Politics is the only thing that you need no training for. You need no certificate for politics. So the good, the bad, the ugly, and the very, very ugly have found themselves in the room. And the saddest thing is that Nigerians say, we want power. When we get it, we'll decide what we want to do with it. Now, in my view, there needs to be, and this, we have a, a Bureau of Statistics. We have a National Planning Commission. But a lot of these service delivering institutions have been so bureaucratized that they are not capable of delivering. And unfortunately for Nigeria, especially with the, with the tradition of the military, we, who said we didn't want long grammar. We now have a country that is run literally on free fall. There is very little intellectual input. Right now, Joe Biden is president of America. I can bet you, if you go to Harvard, you will find that quite a good number of professors are now in Washington. When Biden loses election or finishes his term, they will all go back. If a Republican comes to power, they'll come from Yale, they'll come from Princeton, because governance is an intellectual exercise. So you cannot say that you want to, because even the policy options as to, okay, if I were, when you go to a doctor, well, again, because this is Nigeria, when you go to a doctor, you just say, ah, doctor, how now? I'm just feeling one kind. Okay, because he's a Nigerian doctor, he will pr probably have an idea what feeling one kind is. But you have to say, to, when you say to the doctor, I have stomach ache, he will tell you how long has it been going on for. In Nigeria, people come to power fully unprepared, then they start looking around before they can see party chairman has taken over, party advisors have taken over, traditional rulers have come to over. Everybody is now in the, in the sitting room. And the average Nigerian office holder does not have time to think. So if the question is, what do you want to do for Nigerians? If your business is to feed Nigerians, then it is science. Okay, it is science. You cannot feed by... Your, your husband, for example, can call you and say, hey, Kela, please, I, I'm coming with my friends, okay? Cook. Then you say, okay, Oga, how many people are, just cook, I'm coming with my friends. How many are there? I don't, just cook. Now, you may want to cook, but you need to know whether there are children or whether there are men, women, and whatever. So, now, the good intention of a president is not sufficient to deliver on this thing because already governance and its apparatus are largely criminalized. So every, if I were president, of the, you would know that anything you want to do in this country, if you put money down, it will vanish. The government knows that. Poverty alleviation, when, when President Obasanjo became president in 1999, I think Jega was a member of that commission. They, they, he, they set up something. They put down a thing about whether well, 60 billion. The money vanished. Poverty alleviation programs have never been successful in this country, in part because of the poor thinking. So you are thinking with your head, you are with your heart, but not with your head. 
So people are suffering because maybe it's not because the, the president didn't have a good, a good, a good intention. But in my view, there is a lack of professional input as to how to deliver these services to ordinary people. Because first of all, how many people are you dealing with? We would have known already over the years. If you put 10 bags in their community, the big man will take probably five. Okay? And you saw on television the other day, Palietti, one man who was going, going around saying, this is the one bag that they got. Everybody knows that the institutions responsible for the distribution of social welfare and services are the object of politics and that nothing is going to... So you can throw all this money. We are just throwing money at problems instead of thinking through what needs to be done. I think if I were a president, for example, maybe you would have spent time to ask yourself, okay, so if we if, run the numbers, if we say we have taken well, this, this uh, what do you call it, uh, um, fuel subsidy is gone. Short term, what am I going to do? I have this amount of money. What will I do with it? All right? Where should we put it to? And you could have run those numbers between now and the end of the year to say by the end of the year, this is what is going to happen. Okay, so if you say to Oga, you want, you want 50 naira for, to go to the market, Oga may say, okay, here is, here is uh, 20, uh, 20 naira. Uh, maybe after some time, next tomorrow, money will come. Because if you thought through all this, then we can now begin to figure out how do we keep Nigerians hopeful? What do we communicate to them? Because the most important thing is to carry people along by information. So, and it's not just information by announcements. So in my view, I think that the, the, the president's heart was in the right place, but I don't know that there was enough time for them to think through all these things in terms of how to resolve them, especially given the leaking nature of the bureaucracy. You see, everywhere in the world, where systems are working. And again, I, I'll bore you. You, you. Take an example of a country like Singapore. Now, Lee Kuan Yew became president in 1969 and did not leave office until 1990. Even when he left office and another person took over, he knew that he wanted his son to be, to, you know, to be, to be the prime minister, but his son was not ready. He put somebody there and he himself remained what you call mentor minister because he had put the country on a, on a, on a footing. But the cleverest thing that he did, more than any other person I can think of in the world, was that he picked the bureaucracy. I realized that because the bureaucracy is the conveyor belt for all the good intentions you may have, he decided to professionalize the, you know, the, 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 the civil service. So he gave them salaries that were 80%, the salaries that private sector was giving people. Everybody then felt, therefore wanted to go to the public service. Then he got people with first class and second class. He himself was a first class candidate. His son is a first class candidate. So once you, once, if you don't get your bureaucracy right, Luckily for me, I, and I don't want to bore you, but I have sat down with almost every president in Nigeria, from Shagari to today, Ba General Abacha. And I can see these wonderful human beings, governors, wonderful human beings. I've not met anybody who wants to destroy this country. But the one thing President Shagari said to me was, he said, look, if I show you the bills that I tried to sponsor, you have a national assembly, if you don't pay enough money, your bill will lie there. So it's not about one individual. It's about the quality of the service delivery vehicles and the drivers of these vehicles. That's why I said somebody must have the courage and the confidence to dismantle this, how will I call it? Because it's become, it's a weapon. I mean, it's, diff it's difficult with the kind of political class that if we If you have, have the, the will, let me, you know what Peter Obi said. If you have the, Peter Obi said, look, they ask, how do you fight corruption? He said, if I'm not stealing, my wife is not stealing, my children are not stealing, matter is finished. The question is, sometimes people get into power taking too many loans. And I mean loans, both financial and intentionally. By the time you get there, you are overwhelmed. Because all these people are creeping. And let me tell you, most people that come to see you as president or governor, they mean well for themselves, not for you, even you yourself. So that is why the quality of a president is also determined by the kind of alternative voices that he's listening to. You know, so people, when you, when you get to a situation where people think that, oh, okay, Bishop Kuka is always abusing us, Bishop Kuka is always quarreling with us, which is fine by me, but I have paid my dues. If it is this country, I've spent over 40, almost 40 years of talking. Let me put it that way. So that's not my problem. The point is that a president must be ready 
to sift and do not himself. Because this is where the whole question of special advisors comes in. Now you have you people appoint special, there are governors with 1,000 special advisors, and they say you appoint these special advisors because look, they, it's the only way to keep the, keep the boys quiet. But in reality, there's a young man, uh, George Stephanopoulos, he was President uh, Biden, uh, Clinton's spokesman at the beginning. Stephanopoulos published his biography, and one of the things he said, which caught my attention, he said, look, here he was. For him, the source of his power was that. What gave him pleasure and was ready to spend sleepless nights was that after Hillary, he was the first person Clinton would see in the morning. Because whenever Clinton walked, finished, he would see him. He would have spent the whole night going through the newspapers, the things the president needs to know before he sits in the office in the morning. But the average Nigerian office holder is surrounded by cousins, by nephews, by friends, by all kinds of characters, and they follow you when you step out of your bedroom, and they follow you till you enter your bedroom at night, which is about five o'clock in the morning. And then you wake up the next day and you continue. So I think that, and I hope because President Tinubu was always famous for being a good how will I put it? A pointer. Of Find, finder of find men and women with women. capacity. Yeah. And I hope that he's done that and done it pretty well. Because the challenge now will be to find a bunch of young, roaring to go people who are not thinking about using the platform for political office, but just the joy of serving this. And you've got a lot of fantastic young people around. I mean, it would be nice to see that new crop of people, you know. Well, absolutely. But it has to be deliberate. Because look, for example, look, let me give you an example. Do you know what happened in America? Uh, in, I think, was it 1841? It's a very interesting story. A man called William Harris, you know, was uh, elected president. And he was 68 years old. And for 140 years, he remained on record, the oldest man to hold the, the, the office of president. The person who broke the record was, George, was President Reagan, who became president in 1981 at the age of 69. Now, here we are. The Chief Justice of America is only 67 years old. I'm older than him. He was born in 1953, 67 years old. He was appointed Chief Justice of the United States of America Supreme Court at the age of 50. You look at the record, everywhere you go, nobody, Obama became president at the age of what, at the age of 47. Okay, so this geront you know, even Political Science 101 tells you that gerontocracy is one of the obstacles to democracy. Okay, so uh, democracy is about energy, it's about vision, and we cannot afford the situation of this whole question of, you know, just moving this in a CBC. It's not a village gathering. So there needs to be a bit of energy, and I'm not saying Biden is, uh, you know, whatever, but that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we need more energy in the room so that people who are in office can get power. Because you can be holding up that office without power. That is, people don't, and you can see in Nigeria, when you leave this office and people see you at the airport, they just avoid you. I mean, I, I want you to get your thoughts on, on what the Nigerians should be thinking about right now. Because the pictures that you've painted, you know, it, it reaffirmed a lot of the things that we actually learned, at least in university. You know, uh, the military's in, in, incursion into the political space was the route to hell. It was filled with good intentions, but, but here we are. Uh, for, for the Nigerian who's looking at, because you've gone back to the first dominoes, you know, that led us to where we are. If we can't be taking uh, painkillers for a cancer. For the Nigerian who's listening right now, and, and these pictures seem very bleak, you know, the, the future seems very difficult. What, what, what should they be thinking no. right now? How, how, do they, how do you wake up every morning and put on your clothes and, and no, say, I'm, I'm, I'm I going to do I this wake, today? Wake, look, look, I mean, frankly, how, do I, how do I have hope in my future, in the future of my children? How, no, how no, do I do me, that? Let me tell you the joy I have. And I think, I shouldn't say I think, it's based on my being a Christian. Um, and I'm not being superfluous about that. Because Christianity gives you a completely different perspective of life. Uh, and I have never, at any point in time, except people die or loss of life, I've never ceased to be hopeful about this country. Look, the late, I'm sorry, the former president of the United Kingdom, John Major, uh, he delivered uh, 
a lecture uh, somewhere in Westminster Abbey two years ago. One of the things he said was, he said he asked his, uh, his audience, which would naturally be politicians and very respectable people, he said, look, we've been on our constitution for about 850 years now. Can you please raise up your hand if you believe that the American, I mean the British constitution that we have is working for us? No hand went up. You see, we are, we are pretending to be in a democracy, but there are, there's no philosophical foundation for building. Look, if you look at 15th, 16th century Europe, for example, people like Thomas Hobbes, people like John, uh, John Locke, they offered us a perspective because it's about philosophy. It, philosophy is about imagination. You, what kind of world do I want? There's a, an, an American philosopher, he's called uh, John Rawls. Now, he came up with this whole idea, you know, that for you to create a society that can work, you know, he talks about the fact that you must conceive of a world in which you don't know whether you're going to be. So if you are constructing a road, for example, allow for the fact that your wife may be driving or you may be driving on that road. What should you be looking out for? Thomas Hobbes, for example, in the 15th, 16th century, Thomas Hobbes said, look, it's an Englishman, he said, look, if you want to create a society, because he lived in mortal fear of, the, of, of, of his own personal security because of the time he himself was born. And he said, look, people, there is what he call a state of nature. That is what the Bible will tell you, the unredeemed man, so to say. And that if you allow us on our own, the big fish will eat the small fish, which is what he called the state of nature. We are, as he said, life is nasty, brutish, and short. Therefore, his conception was that you need a big state, which he called the Leviathan. And the big state will then be able, you can surrender your freedoms, and in exchange, the big state will protect you. Now, fast forward. The 17th century comes John Locke. John Locke says, no. The thing to do is privilege individual freedom. Okay, don't, I'm, don't let me, I'm not going to surrender my freedom to somebody else to hold in custody. The Americans bought the philosophy of John Locke. And that is how America, American individualism grew. So Nigeria, there is, that, that is I, one of the things that I am saddened by. It's not even the government. It is the, the death of scholarship in Nigerian universities. Because if people wanted to make money, they wouldn't be teachers. If I wanted to make money, I wouldn't have been a priest. I'm a priest, but people give me a lot of money. Let me put it that the people give me money. Perhaps if I were working, I probably would not, people would not be generous to me as they are now. But if I wanted to make money, I wouldn't have taken this life. Unfortunately, I think that all this talk about ASU and salary or no salary and so on and so forth, they just played themselves into the hands of a state that has now captured the whole idea of what it was to be an academician. So if we have so a more academic for me, society. Yes, because it is the business of the academic to provide the analytical tool by which one, people can come to understand what their rights are. Two, you can frame what a government ought to look like and what a government can do. For example, one governor may not take you seriously, but in almost every state in Nigeria today, Every state, almost every state has a university. Not to talk of federal university, and now private universities. But catch any of these governors, or any of these senators, and ask them whether they are in conversation with any professor in the university. Because elsewhere, what should be happening is that you should have people who are giving you briefing papers, okay? As a student at the Kennedy School, I learned how to write briefing papers. That is that a president is traveling to China. What should a president know? I mean, I mean, we, we, can, we, can talk about, we can talk about all of this for a very, very long time, uh, but we are running out of time. We do have just a few minutes to right. go. Uh, but, 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 you know, just a word for the Nigerian, as I said earlier, you know. Look, this is our country. You, Look, this, is, going? this is our country, and we must continue to push and push the frontiers of knowledge. There's no substitute for the culture of human rights. Look, I, after our Puta panel, I came up with an idea that we should do a catechism of human rights. And the idea was for us to have a small booklet that will help ordinary market women answer questions. If my husband beat me, what did I feed do? If just those kind of, because 
where there is no culture of human rights, all right? People will not place value on themselves. A woman who is victim of a domestic abuse will look at herself and say, I thank God, say, I even get husband self. So people become collaborators even in their own oppression. And I'm saying we cannot live in a country where, and this was my quarrel with the Buhari administration, that somehow because I am not a Muslim, therefore there is nothing. And I come from a place like Southern Kaduna, and I'm saying, wait a minute, you know, this is the quality of education I have. I cannot become a second-class citizen in my own country because I'm not a Muslim. So know your rights. If, 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 if the Nigerian so knows what is accrued know, to because them, what they can we have, actually demand we for have those things. Our source, our, we just hope. That's why Nigeria, we, we, we want good men to govern us. There's nothing like it, it, it would be a stupid girl to say, I'm looking for a good husband to marry. You have to place value on yourself. If you, don't, if you place value on yourself, good men will exist, but bad people is the only way you can get them out of the room. Well, we do have to wrap it up there, Bishop Puka. But I want to thank you very much for speaking with us. It's been very intense. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it made me sad. I should not as, as, as the issue well, of you've Nigeria, got, you've, got do to be sad. you've got to be sad in order to be happy. Okay. Okay. You've got to be sad to be happy. Yep. I want to thank you very much thank and good you. luck with all the work you have ahead of thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, we have had quite a conversation uh, from everyone uh, who has thank been watching right now. Thank you so much for watching. It's been an hour of education from Bishop, ha Bishop Hassan Kuka. And we would love to hear from all of you. Uh, be a part of the conversation. Go on our channels, tv.com website and uh, drop your comments and be a part of what we do here. Thank you so much for watching. I am Kayla Magua. See you next time.